Okay, here's our finished uh, parts from the previous operation to all the blanks so far. This is where we left off on the previous video. If you haven't seen that video, go back and watch that. Now we're going to put this part, the first part in the chuck here. You have to be careful because that OD of that shaft part of the part is going to be ground and uh, nickel plated for the hydraulic cylinder part of this and so you can't put any dings and scratches you got to make sure those chuck jaws are clean and put the part in there and we indicate the run out with the dial indicator on the back part of the shaft with we've already turned to get it running true and after we do this part of it we're gonna indicate the back face of the conical surface just to make sure that it's running reasonably true because the drawing calls for a, um, a five thousandths perpendicularity of the finished face of the part to that shaft so we've got to make sure it's running within a reasonable amount I think here when I checked it it was running within about a thousandth and a half so that's good enough for our purposes here here I'm just roughly setting the chuck jaws for my C0 at a 45 degree angle to give me the maximum amount of clearance for my milling operation now we're going to take this out and put the hammer indicator in and set our, our Z0 for the time being on this back turn surface of the part and then we're going to use the control to calculate the zero according to these drawing dimensions of 1.345 towards the tailstock to get our Z0 for this operation. Here's the machine operation. The first tool is a um, turning tool. We're feeding at um, 14 thousandths per revolution and a surface footage of 650 on the roughing passes of this and the finish cut is at 700 surface footage and five thousandths of an inch per revolution on this tool. We're just facing off, rough, roughing off the um, extra stock on the face here. There's a, about a quarter of an inch of material to come off of here. I sped this up so we didn't have to watch all these facing cuts. I think we're taking an 80 thousandths depth of cut here on these face cuts as well. So that's this tool. And then it then it roughs the OD. Now it's doing the finish cut on the face. I did it with the same tool. And then it, it roughs the OD here. And then it also finishes the OD with the same tool. didn't have any trouble with wear on the insert so I just did the roughing and finishing with the same tool on this in this case. We come in here with a um, tungaloy feed milling cutter and this cutter is going to be running at 700 rpm and it's going to be feeding at 90 inches per minute feed rate. This is a pretty conservative this could have done this a lot faster than this I just I didn't want to move the part in the chuck jaws or anything, so it's being a little careful here. It doesn't really take very long anyway. This is the most efficient way to rough material nowadays with the feed milling cutter. It, you take a shallow depth of cut and a high feed rate. And it actually um, doesn't put a lot of heat into the part and it works real good. And you can have long overhangs on the tool and it, it puts most of the force directly into the spindle of the machine because of the high lead angle on the inserts on a feed milling cutter. And it also thins the chip out so you can do a very high feed rate per um, fluid of the tool. I think this is a five flute tool or five insert on the tool this particular uh, tungonoid feed mill. Just slowed it down here a little bit. This is, I think, 50% uh, right here. 
kind of see the shavings flying off the tool at this slower speed. And I sped it up. That's that's at normal speed right there. And then these passes are at ten times the speed just to get through this so we don't spend forever on the video looking at this feeding. And the next tool is a half inch four flute end mill with a 60,000 tip radius on it. This is um, your adaptive strategy or a tricoidal milling strategy here. So we're taking a full depth to cut and just taking, I don't remember exactly, I think it was about 35 thousandths per pass on the side of the end mill. And the, the tool is running at 3500 RPM and feeding at 35 inches per minute. But it can go up to a maximum of 580 inches per minute I have set on the cycle on its transition moves between, or the air cuts, if you will, between the cutting moves. If it can get that fast, depends on the distance it has to travel, how fast it actually gets up to. The cycle in, in a spree allows you to set a, a maximum feed rate for that transition. See when it, when it moves the air cut. Here I just speeded this up. So we don't have to sit here and watch all of this going through the cut. I don't totally right. I think this is like five times the speed for our member on this. And I slowed it down here a little bit in the middle and can zoom in on it a little so we can see. Um, I should have put a little more light on this in the machine and we would have been able to see it a little clearer. The GoPro camera has a little difficulty when it gets a little bit low on light. And sped it up again here. So we're just roughing out the slots here on the side that form the T on the end of this part. And of course, it's going to rotate around and do the other side. This style of milling works really well for roughing out slots in materials. Particularly in uh, exotic materials, this works good. The end mill tends to be able to cut on the side of the flutes with a shallow depth of cut easier than cutting deep pecs going along like a slotting operation. Um, it's, it takes a little longer than a slotting operation normally would take, but it's, it's um, easier on the tool and the tool will last longer to do this in this case. So it works good to slot out material this way. I don't know if it's because the, the tool can dissipate heat better because it's got a full contact of the flute, maybe. I, I, I don't know. I, I got various theories on that, but I'm not totally sure if they're right or not. I'm going to change the finishing tool. It's the same tool, but this is just a finishing tool. This tool's running at 3,000 RPM and 22 and a half inches per minute feed doing the walls. It's, and I do two passes on each wall, just kind of as a spring pass, so that it takes out any, you know, push off on the tool there. And then the, it's a spring pass with that pass. And then on the face cut on the side of the T, it's running at 3,500 RPM and 35 inches per minute feed rate. It's only taking about 10 thousandths off the face here. Maybe a little more, 10 or 12 thousandths off this face to finish it. What's left from the feed mill. You can see those scallop texture that the feed mill leaves because it's feeding so fast in relation to each insert. 
So that's the finish on the face there. And then of course we're going to rotate around and do the whole same thing on the other side of the part. I just did this with, you know, with this tool because I had it there. And, and if you do this facing operation with, this, with the same finish tool as the uh, slot, you, your dimension remains consistent with the step too. So it works. I mean, I guess I could have done this with a face mill in one pass on that side of the T, but I didn't take another tool. And for only uh, 11 parts, it really isn't necessary. So I sped this up here. I think that was five times speed, and then this goes to ten times right here. And then we come in with a 30,000th corner rounder. Um, this tool is going at 8,000 RPM and 24 inches a minute feed rate. The drawing specified a 30,000th radius on these corners. Otherwise, it would have just deburdened it. It had a dimension on this, so we had to put this corner on there. So I sped this up here as well. Back to tool 80. Here's deeper in the part with the, the little uh, NSK pencil grinder. The deeper those corners in, in here. Using this tool takes kind of a little bit of getting used to because you're actually sort of like climb milling when you uh, use this kind of a tool and, and you gotta kinda use a delicate touch. You can't really do it conventional like pushing like a conventional cut on a bridge board or something because it'll just dig in too much. You, you actually want to let it gently just ride over the corner but it can get away from you. You gotta be careful. It, it'll uh, tend to grab and take off on its own. So you gotta be... It takes a, a little bit of practice after a while. You, not too difficult but it, it can uh, it can take metal off pretty fast I think it's turning 40,000 rpm that's a little carbide tapered carbide burr 8th inch diameter shank in the tool I kind of resisted buying this thing for a long time because it's kind of an expensive little grinder but I've had it for like over 10 years and I haven't had any trouble with it at all it's, it's really nice um, tool and you can you can just twist the end of it there and it releases the collet and you can change tools you don't need to you don't need a wrench or anything you just grab onto that end of it and turn it and it releases the collet you change the burr and it's a constant torque like DC motor or something like that, brushless motor, and it, it has quite a bit of power. You can put in a big cutter in there and it, and it still has power to turn it. So here's the finished part for my part of the machining. It's going to be ground on the OD and then it's going to be nickel plated for everything from the threaded end all the way I guess the T and everything. It's going to be nickel plated. I think it's it's some kind of hydraulic cylinders ram and uh, so that the OD of that turned area has to have a nice finish after grinding. So that's the finished part and um now we've only got, uh, this next shot is going to show uh, two of them are finished and then we've got nine more pieces to go. So thanks for watching the video and please subscribe if you haven't done something.